Okay, so today there will be two speakers, uh, me, uh, my name is Michael Saganov, audiology product manager, and uh, Maya Petrova, our uh, clinical audiologist. The brief agenda of our today's uh, talk. First, I will make some introduction uh, of hearing assessment tests. Then I will talk briefly about near audio overview and comp competitors. And then uh, I will start with ABR theory, and then we will continue with Maya uh, with live recording of ABR. And then uh, I will show the software operation, specifically temp template setup and analysis uh, and post-processing. After this, I will talk about ASSR and uh, theory, and then we will continue with hands-on live demonstration with Maya. And we will end this talk with uh, question, questions and answers session. So introduction, uh, hearing assessment tests. First, I would like to start with hearing, uh, sorry, with ear anatomy. There are three main parts of the human ear, outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. The main uh, part of the inner ear is the cochlea. And uh, after this, there, there is also retrocochlear pathways, uh, which consist of the auditory nerve and different uh, structures of the brain, like brain, brain stem and up to auditory cortex. Now uh, about the distinction between subjective and objective tests of hearing. Uh, there are subjective tests which uh, require the attention of the patient. For example, in the pure tone audiometry, the patient must be awake and must react to the, must understand the instructions and uh, react accordingly. For example, click on the patient button. And so these tests are subjective. But uh, especially for pediatric applications, uh, most important tests for us are objective, which do not require uh, any cooperation with the patient at all. So the patient could be even a sleeping baby. And also the objective tests of hearing could be distinguished uh, based on the site of lesion, which uh, they can help identify. So usually they, they could be applied in the, in the following order. We can start with tympanometry uh, to find out if there is a conductive hearing loss problems with middle ear. Then we can continue uh, with autoacoustic emissions to find out if there are problems uh, with the cochlea itself. And after this, we can continue with auditory brainstem response tests to uh, detect any retrocochlear pathology if they're present. Uh, this uh, large table uh, summarizes uh, different auditory electrophysiology applications in audiology today. So I will uh, comment it briefly. So in the left, uh, the first column is a clinical application and other columns are different tests of different types of auditory work potentials. So first application in this table is newborn hearing screening. And the main test among auditory work potentials for hearing screening is ABR. Specifically, the screening test is called automated ABR or AABR. Uh, next application is estimation of audiogram or of hearing thresholds for different uh, frequencies. And uh, for this application, uh, we can use ABR, especially frequency specific ABR, like using the Tombers stimuli and ASSR as well. Another application is narrow diagnostic assessment. It could be for infants and young children, could be for adults. And uh, usually for infants, ABR and sometimes electrocochleography is used. Uh, for adults, uh, also electrocochleography, ABR, and different types of cortical log potentials are used. Another possible assessment is uh, CAPD or cortical central auditory processing disorder assessment. For this, since this is uh, rela related to the auditory cortex, so we use the uh, middle and long latency uh, work potentials or as they are called cortical auditory work responses. 
and uh, also cognitive evoked responses like P300 and mismatch negativity could, could be used. And a final clinical application in this table is outcome documentation. So, for example, during different uh, rehabilitation programs, for example, after cochlear implantation or after hearing aids fitting, uh, the patient needs to uh, undergo the lengthy period of rehabilitation. And during this period, uh, we need to track, or the audiologist needs to track the progress of the patient, the improvement, gradual improvement of hearing. And uh, for this, usually, the, also the cortical potential tests are used, uh, especially long latency response. Uh, now let's uh, talk about Neuro audio device, which is our device for clinical ABR and autoacoustic emission diagnostics. And this device allows to do a lot of tests. I will uh, list them in the next slide. Uh, this is a PC based device. And uh, if we look at our whole uh, audiology product line, we also find several other products like Audio Smart and A Screen. But we will focus on these products uh, tomorrow. But today we will focus only on near audio. So what is near audio? It is uh, all in one system, which can do all kinds of auditory work potentials, especially ABR, which is most often used among them. Also autoacoustic emission tests and screening pure tone audiometry. One of the main uh, advantages of this device when it comes to its main application, ABR, is it can do non-sedated ABR. Because uh, typically or historically, uh, ABR test required sedation of the patient, especially of the pediatric patient, children. But uh, near audio can uh, work without this. I will uh, talk how this is possible. Now let's talk about, the, uh, about why, why near audio is all in one system. Because it offers uh, its support supports a wide variety of hearing assessment techniques. Uh, the first main uh, seg segment, first main, uh, so to say, technique uh, group is auditory work potentials. It consists of ABR, or auditory brainstem response, ASSR, auditory state state response, cortical work potentials, VEMP, which is another type test called vestibular evoked myogenic potential, also, electrocopliography, cognitive evoke potentials like P300 and mismatch negativity, and automated ABR for screening. Now, there are also three types of autoacoustic emissions. Uh, two of them are most widely used in clinics, transient evoked autoacoustic emissions and distortion product autoacoustic emission. And the third type, spontaneous emissions, is used only for scientific investigations and so on, uh, typically, it is not used in clinics. And the third uh, test group is, or test, specific test, is uh, pure tone audiometry uh, used for screening in near audio device. And uh, I should say that this type of application is not the main focus of near audio device. So, uh, non sedated ABR is, uh, uh, so to say, killer feature. <laughs> of a near audio device, a unique feature. And it, made, it is made possible mainly by the fact that the device is USB powered. So it does not need any mains connection only to the PC itself, because the device is powered uh, by the USB from the laptop or PC. And uh, the main advantage is that you can simply unplug the power supply from the laptop and you can record uh, the tests. This, uh, this trick allows to reduce the electrical interference in a very great, to, to a very great degree. So it is a very important uh, tool. You can use it to your advantage. And also there are different software techniques which can be used uh, for also to allow non-sedated ABR, uh, which uh, involve advanced stimulus and signal processing. For example, weight, weighted averaging and chirp stimulus. I will continue with the ABR or auditory brainstem response theory. So, uh, what uh, generators or what signal sources 
uh, inside the human ear analyzer uh, com uh, contribute to the different waves of the different parts of the ABR and other work potential responses. As you can see in this uh, picture, uh, the brainstem response uh, comes, especially the waves four and five, come mainly from the brainstem and nearby structures. And uh, early cortical response and late cortical response, they're mainly generated by the uh, structures which come further along the neural pathway up to the auditory cortex. So if uh, I describe, try to describe the ABR acquisition, it goes uh, in the following way. There is a telephone or a speaker, usually it's a headphone uh, put on the patient's head, which produces the stimulus. The stimulus goes through the ear canal, basically the uh, auditory, it's uh, the sound, sound wave at this, at this point in time. After this, it's uh, when it comes through the middle ear structures and uh, to the cochlea, in the cochlea, it gets transformed to the electrical uh, neural activity. And this uh, neural activity travels further along uh, the auditory nerve through the brain stem. And uh, this is where the main part of the ABR response gets generated, which we record using the electrodes put on the head, on the scalp. And uh, they are further amplified by the device amplifier. The main problem uh, with ABR recording is that uh, the signal, the evoked response itself, is very small in amplitude. And uh, the noise uh, is usually much larger. And there are many sources of noise. As you can see on the picture, uh, they can come from the uh, mains supply or power line. They can come from the radio frequencies spectrum. They can come from the patient, uh, for example, physiological noise many sources, in fact, like EMG or muscle activity and uh, so on. Uh, so uh, we, ne we need to rely on advanced stimulus processing in order to record such small stimulus among this large noise. And uh, as I said, there are many techniques implemented in your audio device to allow non-sedated ABR recording. The stimulus which is used for ABR is the most widely used is click, which is a wide uh, spectrum response, wide, wide spectrum stimulus. As you can see, it covers uh, frequencies, uh, uh, broad range of frequencies. And when you look at its time waveform, it is a, just a very short uh, rectangle uh, waveform. But it is when you look at the electrical signal itself, when you look at the response from the actual uh, headphone, it gets distorted a little bit and due to the movement of the diaphragm of, of the driver of the headphone, it uh, becomes biphasic, up and down, moves up and down. And another also widely used uh, stimulus, which is by the way frequency specific, is tone burst. And you can see its waveform on the left and spectrum on the right. And uh, for tone burst, there are also different uh, window functions which contribute to making this stimulus even more frequency specific, especially the most widely used uh, window function is Blackman. And as you can see at the bottom right corner, it contributes to the most uh, frequency specific tone burst spectrum. Uh, the chirp stimulus uh, provides advantage of maximizing wave five amplitude, as you can see on the right, uh, the wave five uh, produced with the chirp stimulus is much larger, especially near threshold. There are two main clinical applications uh, of ABR. One of them is actually assessing hearing thresholds, but objectively, uh, which is especially useful for uh, small children and even infants, for example. So we are looking for wave five threshold and latency intensity function. And second application is autoneurological ABR, uh, where we look for uh, absolute wave latencies, interpeak intervals, and so on. And usually the recording is done at some super threshold level. And uh, another possible uh, clinical application of ABR is that you can, it can help you uh, find out the type of hearing loss which the patient has because depending on the type of hearing loss, 
you can see that the waveform changes significantly. So what uh, can be done by the audiologist uh, to improve the quality of the ABR recording? So first important thing is that the patient uh, must be prepared accordingly. Uh, he or she should be relaxed or asleep and eyes closed. Uh, another important factor is that electrode impedance uh, should be low enough, be, be, uh, be lower than three and five kilo ohm. And this uh, is normally achieved by preparing the skin with abrasive uh, paste or gel. And uh, another important thing is braiding electrode cables, or uh, we may produce something like a twisted pair out of the electrode cables in order to reduce the interference uh, from the uh, different electronic appliances or even the mains uh, grid itself uh, for our recording. And uh, of course, it's important to have a quality electrical grounding in the room, in the test room. And uh, as I said before, the killer feature with near audio device is that it is possible to record from a laptop on battery power. This is a really unique feature and uh, it allows to record in very difficult conditions. So the electrode placement, electrode placement uh, for two channel recording is like this. Uh, usually there is a notation, color notation used in audiology. Blue color corresponds to left ear and left mastoid. Red color corresponds to right mastoid or right ear. And left ear should be connected to the channel one and uh, the electrode uh, from the right mastoid should be connected to the channel two. And there are two types of electrode montage, depending on the electrodes used, for example, cup electrodes and disposable electrodes. We will use uh, disposable electrodes during our live demonstration. So we will use the second uh, montage on the right-hand side. Two electrodes will be on the forehead and two on each, uh, on mastoids each. So now I would uh, invite Maya our audiologist to perform the test. Maya, please continue. Uh, thank you, Michael. And I'm glad to see everyone today. And now we will go further to the practice. Uh, here is Yakov, our patient today. And uh, as Michael said uh, before, it will be ideal then our patient will be sleeping during the test. But now in our situation today, our patient will be sitting relaxed in this chair. But uh, I should note that ideal that uh, your patient will lie down and um, during natural sleep, if you will uh, register ABR. So um, and now uh, we have positioned some electrodes and I will show you how to prepare the skin properly on the excess example of the of last electrode. Uh, and uh, before this, I will uh, show you what accessories uh, we, uh, we will use. We can uh, use uh, different types of electrodes. As Michael said before, okay, some technical problems. Uh, Michael, could you please stop the demonstration? Yes, thank you. Okay, so now, um, okay, uh, uh, I, I have said about uh, different types of electrodes. So uh, today we will use uh, self adhesive uh, single use uh, electrodes, hydrogel, but also you can use uh, cups electrode. Uh, electrodes, for example, before applying, you should uh, fill them with the uh, special adhesive paste. If you use such types of electrode, uh, single use hydrogel, you uh, should use special connectors, uh, cables with alligator uh, connectors. I will show you now. Um, also, um, we can use during the ABR testing different types of stimulators. Uh, today, we will use um, 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 inset earphones. Thank you, Alexei. With the uh, single use um, tips for um, uh, them. 
because uh, we have here not ideal uh, environmental condition due to the noisy environment and electromagnetic um, interference and uh, the this type of stimulator helps us to reduce environmental noise to our patient but also you can use for example uh, tdh uh, stimulator as you can see here this is the classical type of stimulator so also you can use them then you uh, register abr on the uh, air conduction study if you uh, have some doubts about uh, conduction here in loss uh, conductive hearing loss, you can use also uh, such types of stimulator, um, a bone vibrator. But now, uh, today, we will show you um, uh, the test uh, using um, inset earphones. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let's prepare the skin for the last electrode. I will uh, put spiritus and degrees the skin as michael said before uh, we uh, will uh, use two channels montage scheme so uh, we put one electrode in the high forehead uh, two electrodes uh, on the mastoids and one electrodes uh, for the ground we will put on the lower forehead if you use cup electrodes, you can put uh, uh, the reference electrode here on the uh, vertex. Uh, it's um, frequently used in the neurological practice, but audiologists likes and prefer to use uh, this hem than the reference electrode is putting on the high forehead. So uh, we need to put the ground electrode, so the degrees the skin with the spiritus. And now we will use the abrasive paste. And gently, we will gently rub the skin till the slightly redness. Uh, it allows us to uh, make impedance um, lower. So we can put the ground electrode and now uh, we can uh, connect our electrodes to the amplifier using the alligator connectors. I uh, have twist uh, the cables before. Okay, I, I have twist the cables. It uh, allows us to reduce the electromagnetic interference uh, came from our <laughs> not ideal environment. So um, I will um, connect it uh, to the uh, amplifier. This is the ground socket. Blue is for uh, first channel. Red is for second channel and now I need to use the special um, adapter to combine uh, the cable uh, which will connect our um, reference electrode. Okay and now we can connect the electrode. So uh, ground electrode on the low forehead, reference electrode is on the high forehead, or it can be on the vertex if you use cup electrodes. Now, uh, left mastoid connected with the blue cable for the first channel, and the right mastoid connect with the red alligator to the second channel 
Now uh, we can position the, our stimulator on the patient. Let's connect our inserts to the amplifier. They see that the color um, coding here. So red to the right and uh, blue for the left socket. And now we can position it on our patient. The left one, the right. And we need to uh, roll uh, the tips between the fingers and to insert in the ears, ear canal. Before uh, inserting, we need to, uh, to see the ear canal making otoscopy and uh, to get that our patient uh, has no any contraindication to insert uh, uh, this type of stimulator. Now uh, we can go to the program. Okay. A, a demonstration, okay. Yes, we have previously tried to register some um, responses and now I will close it and um, we'll start uh, one more time. So uh, let's go to set up and see information about our um, stimulator. So uh, we see that uh, we use inserts now and the right model of our inserts and please uh, see it before you make stimulation of your patient because it uh, can um, brought a mistake to your test uh, if you use not proper stimulator. So choose the proper one. And after that, uh, we can uh, create the new, um, the new test. So we need, uh, we need to um, print the patient's data. And some other information, if you want, you can choose also the uh, diagnosis if you have uh, uh, listing it from the standard diagnosis list. After you have finished, press OK and choose uh, the necessary template. Uh, let's uh, choose the uh, ABR-based template for now. And we will go to the main test window. Uh, they see uh, here uh, the button of the impedance checking. Okay. Uh, let's let's uh, let's uh, add uh, the second channels. We have only one here, so the first channel is for the left mastoids and one, and for the right mastoid. Okay you can make it during the actual test. And now, okay, they see that the impedance is well enough. Uh, it's uh, uh, the good situation that your impedance uh, needs to be in the two kilo ohms borders. And uh, you see um, uh, that uh, there is no any big difference between pairs of electrodes. So it is not good that in one channel, if, if you get, for example, two kilo ohms and on the second channel you have, for example, uh, 0.5 kilo ohms. It's not a good situation. It will be better if uh, your numbers will be near to each other. So uh, now it's good. Close this window and now uh, we ask our patient to 
uh, relaxed, be relaxed to relax the neck muscles, face muscles, to close the eyes and to stay still during the stimulation. So uh, we need to monitor the signal which we have now, basically. Um, okay, Yakov, please, uh, please construct your neck and to sh uh, it will show us the artifacts here. <laughs> okay, okay, and now relax, relax. And they see that it's critically um, important that your signal must be low enough in this border, green borders must be uh, much of time you see in the monitoring. In some cases, uh, there are some examples, uh, uh, for example, if in your laboratory there are a lot of uh, devices, medical and uh, other devices, um, which can make a lot of electromagnetic noise, it's not good uh, and you need to switch them on or maybe uh, try to search another place for registration, for example. Okay, if uh, your uh, signal is low enough, you also can make these borders uh, narrow, more narrow, for example, seven microvolts or even five microvolts, but now we can't do it because uh, our signal is not flat. And uh, uh, then your borders are uh, more narrow. Uh, uh, the time to acquire a good um, response will be shorter. So we can switch on and see. Here the uh, starting stimulation intensity, it's 17 dB. And uh, the uh, frequency of stimulation now it's 21 hertz. In the biological practice, it can be uh, faster, up to 50 uh, hertz, for example, and uh, it, it will reduce the time uh, uh, of registration. So let's start from the uh, 17 and start the registration stimulation. We see here the two curves, one uh, for the uh, IPSI channel. So we stimulate and registrate from the right side. So uh, the sound is going through the right uh, part of the inserts and, red, and uh, this signal is uh, registered from the second channel, red channel on the right mastoid and contra side. So sounds go from the right side and the signal is registered from the contra side, left side. It is useful um, to check the latency of the five peak stimuli using the contra side in some cases, but in mostly um, we can also switch on uh, switch off uh, the contra side if uh, we don't need them, for example. Uh, here you see uh, the sum numbers. This is number of uh, averaging uh, we get uh, by default it to uh, thousands. And uh, we can make it some more, for example, on the uh, nearly treasured intensities. Um, up to 800, for thousands, thousands, yes. And here you see uh, some numbers about uh, statistical information. This is the uh, number of reproducibility of response. It, uh, the more it is, uh, the better it is. <laughs> so it, uh, yes. And uh, the uh, last one is the number of uh, noise. Uh, residual noise and uh, the low it is, the better it is. So we, we see that the curves are stable and we can stop this cycle. And to check if uh, we have the true response, we all this uh, should make the second cycle of stimulation on uh, this intensity, one more cycle. Uh, to um, make 
make the process of stimulation more easy, the doctor can uh, form uh, the uh, stimulation line, yes. Uh, and uh, for example, I need uh, some cycle on 60 dBs and one more cycle on 60 dBs and so on, going to the treasure. And uh, I, in this time, uh, then the registration is going, I can, uh, I can see on my curves, for example, put in the markers and so on. So it's very um, comfortable during the stimulation that I should not pay any attention to the stimulation line. So they see that the reproducibility is good. They see the main peaks are on the same positions. On the Ipsy side and on the contra side, they see the third and the fifth peak here. The reproducibility on the contra side can be lower. So the main process is on the Ipsy side. So we can stop. And they see that our automatically line going continues, yes. So uh, let's switch on now and see the main peaks are there and we can uh, position our markers now. So the first one, this is the second peak, the third, uh, the fourth and the five peaks are combined here in this patient. And 5a to estimate the amplitude of the five peak. And so uh, they see here in the uh, graphs that the latency are on the normal um, Sites, yes, and see the numbers of the latency here in the table below. And uh, they see that the process of stimulation is going and they see that something like five peak here in the 60 dBs. Uh, so we uh, go further in this manner. I think uh, we, <laughs> we shouldn't go to the treasure now and I will show you uh, uh, the prepared um, the prepared um, before recording, yes, there. And um, uh, here we can see uh, the full process of recording up to the treasure. So we see that they start from the 85 dBs, uh, the good reproducibility. We see that uh, we use click stimuli and shop stimuli during one uh, acquisition. So then 17, 15, 30, and we see that now on the uh, uh, treasured intensity, they see that using click, uh, we get very low amplitude peak and the doctor uh, can have uh, can uh, have some doubts, is it a peak or no. So in such cases, uh, we can make additional uh, registration with the chirp stimuli and they see that the amplitude of five peak is much um, higher. So it's useful to use CHIRP, uh, then uh, you get to this nearly treasured intensity. And uh, uh, the same process on the left side. Uh, also, uh, uh, we can um, see that, as the Michael said before, uh, we have uh, a lot of types of stimuli. Uh, we using CLICK. Uh, or chirp for uh, broadband um, 
uh, treasure to estimation, yes. And if uh, we need to look for frequency specific treasure, to we should use tone burst or frequency specific chirp or chirp LS stimuli. And uh, using such frequency specific stimuli, we can make uh, uh, audiogram, estimated audiogram, yes. Okay, now uh, I think I uh, I ask Michael yeah. to um, set some words about uh, your audio program. Uh, yes, thank you, Maya. Uh, so now I would like to talk uh, a little bit more about the different uh, test uh, template setup and uh, post-processing features. So let's start this uh, test template setup. I will focus mainly again on the ABR test now. When you open the test template window, you will see uh, several panels or tabs of parameters. And uh, by the way, uh, before, I, before I go further, I would like to talk, uh, tell about important distinction uh, when it comes to editing test templates. If you want uh, to uh, make some temporary change to the settings, uh, you can go to the uh, tool, uh, toolbar button here, test template setup, and you can change the settings as Maya did. And it will only affect the current test session. But if you want to make some settings change permanent, then you need to go to the menu setup, test templates, customize. And in this uh, window, when you edit any template, the changes will be permanent. So they will be saved uh, for further use with other test sessions. This is important distinction. Now, so I will go to the temporary test template setup. And uh, the first step is parameters. Parameters uh, usually, uh, in this case, uh, it uh, comprises of uh, several uh, groups of settings, for example, uh, uh, related to recording, related to stop criteria, and related to uh, optimizing the recording. So uh, the recording uh, settings are the following. The stimulation rate, it is, uh, or the frequency, uh, how Maya called it, it is uh, basically the rate uh, of stimulation or how often uh, the, the stimulus, next stimulus uh, comes after the first one. So how often do they come to the headphone? And uh, second setting is analysis time window which is uh, the duration of the waveform, ABR waveform, which we see on the screen. And uh, actually these two settings are related together. So, because if you make uh, analysis time window too long, it can, uh, it can also have second, uh, next following stimulus inside the analysis time window, which is not uh, very good. But uh, the software uh, by default protects uh, from this situation there is a protection. So when you increase, uh, let's try to increase stimulation rate first, and you see that uh, the higher we set it, the lower the analysis time window becomes. It happens automatically. In order uh, to maintain uh, the analysis time window uh, no longer than interstimulus interval. Uh, but usually it is no problem at all because uh, stimulation rate, uh, we recommend to set it uh, no higher than uh, 30 or even the highest value we recommend to use is 29 because for these values, uh, you, you can see that optimized recording checkboxes are all uh, enabled and uh, so different features to maximize recording quality are applied or minimize interference. But as soon as you make the stimulation rate uh, higher, 
the, some of the features for optimization of recording get uh, grayed out or disabled because they cannot operate with such a uh, high frequency stimulation rate. But again, this is usually not a problem because uh, stimulation rate also affects the waveform and the waves which we see on it for ABR. And usually in practice, uh, stimulation rate is not that high, no higher than 30 uh, hertz or 30 stimulus per second. Because for higher stimulation rates, uh, all the other waves usually disappear and all we see is only wave five. And uh, uh, let's uh, continue with other settings. There is a setting for ejection level or uh, you can change it here or in the monitoring window like Maya did. And uh, also you can specify reject disabled period. This is interesting setting. It uh, means that usually for some time after the stimulus, uh, there is a stimulus artifact. And uh, we need to make sure that stimulus artifact does not uh, activate our rejection system. So uh, we can customize it by using this setting. And uh, default value is good enough if you use short stimulus like click, but if you use longer stimulus like chirp, it, it is uh, maybe a good advice to increase this value up to, for example, three and a half milliseconds. And uh, next settings are soft attenuator, which means uh, gradual uh, increase in stimulation level until you reach the target level which could be useful for uh, sleeping children, for testing sleeping children, to not wake them up by sudden uh, loud stimulation. Also, uh, second setting here in this line is a show FMP or RNL, RNL chart, which is a useful way to see historic chart of these values, how they change over the duration, during the duration of the test, because the recording window contains the current shows the current values of FMP and RNL, but also it can display this chart, which sometimes is useful to see uh, how fast, for example, the residual noise decreases. Also, there is a press stimulus time setting, which is uh, could be used, for example, to visually assess the baseline level or noise level. Uh, if you make it, uh, let's say, minus five or min minus 10 uh, milliseconds. It means that the recording will start uh, 10 milliseconds uh, before the stimulus onset. And uh, you will see the baseline before any stimulation. Uh, even and odd traces. This is uh, also a useful setting, especially useful when it is in, in the second uh, setting, setting, second value, even to odd one which is also labeled uh, auditory neuropathy. Uh, this is important because for patients with auditory neuropathy, we will get no ABR response, like a flat line, using the typical click with alternating polarity. Uh, so this stimulus will go up, uh, next stimulus will go down, and so on. They will repeat alternating the polarity, uh, which is the default setting for click stimulus. But in this case, uh, for auditory neuropathy patients, there will, be, there will be no response. And so uh, normally it is recommended in this case to record separately for condensation polarity response and sec uh, separately reflection polarity response. But with this setting, as it is set uh, like this, auditory neuropathy, we will need to just uh, click the button show A and B buffers and uh, these two buffers or two waveforms uh, will uh, show exactly what we need in this case. It will show one trace will show the alternate uh, the condensation polarity response, another trace will show a reflection polarity response. And so, uh, with the patients with auditory neuropathy, we will see typically a butterfly pattern uh, near the start of the waveform. So this is the cochlear microphonic, and this finding uh, confirms the auditory neuropathy diagnosis. So this is important, but also for testing the, for auditory neuropathy, it is important to use only the insert earphones because uh, using them, we separate in time the 
uh, start of the actual response, or in this case, the cochlear microphonic and the stimulus artifact. They are separated in time because the insert earphone uses the plastic tube, which introduces uh, the delay uh, from the time the stimulus is generated and until the time the stimulus actually enters the tympanic membrane in the ear. Uh, and another advantage of insert earphones uh, is that it is blocking the outside noise. So it is one of the, one of the reasons why we use them here. So uh, let's continue with other settings on the parameters tab. Uh, the stop criteria. It describes uh, the criteria which the software uses uh, to automatically stop the recording. By default, uh, there is just a maximum stimulus, uh, maximum stimuli count. So by default, after 2000 stimuli, uh, the recording stops automatically. Uh, but we can increase this uh, value also during the recording as was shown previously. And also we can customize the software uh, so that the recording stops also based on the statistical values. For example, based on FSP value or based on the residual noise level value. And uh, when it comes to uh, recording optimization, as I said, there is a special feature for minimizing interference, which actually introduces the stimulus jitter. So the stimulation rate actually varies a little bit in order to uh, desynchronize from the mains uh, interference or mains uh, higher frequency harmonics. And weighted averaging is also important feature to save time during the recording, especially in noisy conditions. And uh, by the way, you can specify the type of weighted averaging uh, in our software. There are several, several algorithms and we recommend uh, to use uh, the default one, LSM, which is least square method, method our Nearsoft developed algorithm, which in our uh, tests works usually the best. But uh, for example, if you want to, if you are used to using a Bayesian weighted averaging with some other competitor devices, for example, then you can select it here. And actually there is another a slight uh, variability, a slight uh, uh, comment I would like to add about using these different algorithms. Uh, some doctors uh, or audiologists, they rely on the percentage of rejected traces during the recording as an indicator of quality of the recording. And in this case, if, if this uh, percentage of rejected traces is important to you, then I would recommend to use Bayesian weighted averaging because it also takes into account the rejection threshold. If you set up uh, LSM algorithm, which is default, uh, there will be no rejection percentage displayed because due to the specifics of this algorithm, uh, it uh, almost uh, not uses uh, the rejection. It only rejects uh, very minimal traces like flat lines or very large waveforms like uh, due to the saturation of the amplifier, for example. But other traces in between, uh, it uh, uses just the different weight coefficients, weight, weighted values to assess uh, to their quality, their quality yeah, of each individual epoch or native trace. Okay, uh, let's continue with the hardware panel, which is, uh, which has two, two uh, sections for amplifier settings and stimulator settings. Uh, Maya has shown already some uh, settings which you can change in the stimulator setup. For example, uh, stimulus waveform one of the most uh, used ones, I think, here. But sometimes you will need to, for example, change maybe polarity of the stimulus or enable masking noise or, um, for example, change the values for tone burst and so on. And on the amplifier settings panel, I think uh, normally it is not, used, not, not uh, needed to change anything. But uh, if you like, to experiment or you need it for some reason, you can change, for example, the filters, filter range and maybe signal input range. But it must be 
used only with, with caution when you know what you are doing. <laughs> and normally it is best to stick with defaults here. Okay, and when it comes to other uh, panels, uh, I will skim briefly. Uh, there is channels panel where you can set up the number of channels to use. There is a markers panel where you can customize the markers uh, and analysis of intervals, amplitudes, and so on. View panel customizes uh, the uh, different display settings. For example, you can display some simulation values near the waveform and so on. And there is also automated, uh, fully automated protocol, which you can use to automate some parts of testing, for example. You just uh, can set up a series of actions which the software will follow automatically. Okay, that's it for test template setup. And uh, also I would like to stress the importance of some post uh, processing features. Some of them Maya has shown already. For example, you can manually or automatically combine the waveforms uh, by their baseline to compare reproducibility. You can do this automatically also by clicking the button with the lightning symbol for the similar intensity, uh, stimulus intensity. And also uh, you can filter the recordings after the actual, the, after the test is finished, you can select the waveform and go to the menu trace, filter or fast filter. Fast filter applies uh, immediately and uh, filters uh, allows you to allows you to add the filter trace as a new new waveform if you click it here checkbox if you want to preserve uh, the original waveform as well and also sometimes useful is the feature to uh, calculate uh, new traces based on the recorded ones for example the most uh, useful way to use it is you can select uh, two waveforms at the same intensity level by using control and left mouse click. And then you can go to the menu, trace, calculation, average, epochs. And you will see the grand average response here, which is uh, the waveform which contains all the averages of these two waveforms combined. And usually this uh, leads to a more cleaner smoother waveform and with less noise and higher signal to noise ratio. Uh, by the way, uh, as Maya mentioned, this uh, cr criteria, statistical value FSP or FMP, it is uh, another way to think about it is basically a signal to noise ratio squared. So uh, I think I will finish with ADAR at this point and continue with my presentation I briefly talk about the ASSR, another test among the developed potentials, uh, which is um, called also auditory uh, steady state response. So I will stop the demonstration of the software and continue with the dem demo of my slides. So ASSR test can be recorded with absolutely the same electrode montage or placement as we used for ADR. The principle of ASSR recording. Let's start with the stimulus description. For ASSR, historically, uh, there was um, amplitude modulated stimulus being used or uh, frequency modulated stimulus. Or there could be combined stimulus uh, called mixed modulation, which is AM, plus FM. Uh, now, when it comes to response, the response in this test is generated the following way. The stimulation rate is very high. And uh, we have, as you can see on the left-hand side, several uh, repeating uh, responses uh, consisting of ABR and especially middle latency response. They overlap together due to high stimulation rate. And so the neural activity becomes synchronized with the modulation rate or the stimulation rate. And we have so-called steady state wave. 
And uh, another important uh, thing to note, uh, to comment about is uh, modulation frequencies uh, choice. Specifically in ASSR, there are two main uh, modulation frequencies which could be used, 40 and 90 Hertz. And why they were choose, chosen? chosen? Uh, because uh, as you can see on these pictures from research papers, uh, the scientists, they uh, made recordings, series of recordings at different modulation rates in normal hearing patients, in adults and children, in sleeping subjects and awake subjects. And the conclusion of these studies was, uh, the uh, re result was this, that uh, the two mo most important uh, analysis uh, modulation frequencies uh, were selected. First frequency, P1, here is 40 hertz. And as you can see, the amplitude of the response is the highest for ASSR in this case. Uh, but uh, its drawback is that uh, 40 hertz response uh, completely disappears, uh, almost completely disappears during sleep. So if the patient is asleep, we cannot use this frequency. So we need to switch to 90 hertz frequency. And even though uh, for 90 hertz, uh, the response amplitude is uh, significantly lower, uh, we have to use it for asleep patients and also sometimes for testing children because children also it is recommended to test uh, when they are sleeping because uh, uh, this test is very sensitive to physiological or muscle noise because the signal level is even lower than for ABR. So it must be recorded in almost ideal conditions, preferably with patients sleeping. Uh, now, regarding the analysis of the response, ASSR test is also different from ABR uh, because uh, it involves fu fully automatic analysis compared to the ABR, where the doctor or audiologist needs to analyze the waveform manually. Here it is fully automated and it is based on the FFT spectrum because uh, the, for example, amplitude modulated stimulus produces the following FFT of the response. As you can see, we should see clearly the uh, very clear uh, response at the modulation frequency, which is in this case 95 Hertz. And all the other neighboring frequencies are uh, only much lower in amplitude and they contain only noise. So we have high signal to noise ratio for the modulation frequency. And uh, now another uh, important uh, advantage of ASSR is that we can use multiple frequencies for stimulation. For example, uh, four frequencies are typically used in one ear with slightly different modulation rates and we can see all of the responses, identify them, uh, each one of them on the spectrum, which is very, uh, very time efficient because we can test four frequencies uh, in both ears at the same time. Uh, regarding multi-SSR, you can see the whole uh, principle on this picture of the test. So there are four main carrier frequencies uh, or audiometric frequencies, and they are modulated by different modulation rates. And then they are combined together to the com compound stimulus, which produces uh, this result pattern. And the end result of ASSR test is estimated audiogram. Uh, similarly to what can be achieved with Stoneburst ABR, but with Stoneburst it takes uh, significantly more time. So it's very time consuming. So that's why ASSR is so useful clinically, because it allows you to save time and get estimated audiogram usually much faster. And this estimated audiogram uh, involves usage of the values, uh, conversion values from these published papers and uh, these values are used because there is a slight difference between the stimulus used for the uh, ASSR test and for, for example, actual audio audiometry test, peer-tone audiometry. And because of different stimuli and recording principles, there is a different correction which needs to be applied. But this is also applied automatically by the software. And all you need to look at uh, is at the red or blue symbols on the estimated audiogram, that's it. But keep in mind that this is estimation and so there is uh, some degree of possible error 
for each of these uh, values. And also that's why for this uh, test, especially multi-SSR test, normally it's recommended to test until we get the response at 30 dB HL. This is considered uh, normal hearing. So it is not useful to spend more time to get to lower stimulation levels. But when it comes to real hearing loss, when the hearing threshold is increased, uh, ASSR actually also increases in uh, get better accuracy of the results. And so uh, another important question uh, or distinction between these tests, single frequency and multi-frequency ASSR is uh, actually, I think it is unique feature of near audio device that we have both of them and uh, the user, the audiologist can choose uh, which one to use, but how, how to choose? Uh, I would suggest uh, the following reasons to choose one or another. The main reason I would say is that ASSR uh, allows uh, to select uh, more frequencies uh, because multi-SSR due to complex uh, stimulus generation and hardware limitations only allows to use four frequencies uh, and in ASSR there, there are more available, but they are only one at a time at one level at a time. And the test for ASSR single frequency is only manual, but for multi-ASSR, uh, we have option and by default it's enabled to proceed this test automatically. So it is very convenient. And also, uh, also important to say that multi-ASSR uh, uses, so to say more modern, more complex uh, detection algorithm or technique. And in, in general, I would say that it should be more, a little bit more accurate. So when in doubt, I would recommend uh, to stick with multi-SSR because it has, uh, in my opinion, um, much more advantages, especially saving time. Now, uh, before we finish our presentation, I would like uh, again to invite Maya to show us the live recording of ASSR technique. Maya, please come. Thank you. Uh -huh. Let's go. Let's go to to the practice. As the Michael uh, have said before, uh, uh, our patient is ready for the multi ISSR or ISSR registration because we have positioned the electrodes uh, on him, and uh, the state of the electrode positioning is the same as it um, uh, was in the APR testing. So also we can use the different types of stimulator. Uh, today we are using inserts again, but uh, you also can use uh, headphones, uh, something like this. Uh, I uh, should note uh, one more time uh, that uh, the more relaxed or even asleep uh, your patient will be, uh, the better result you will get. If uh, you test um, a child, uh, he or she must be sleeping um, at all. No any variant here, so you can uh, register multi-SSR then your child is sleeping and you should use only 19 hertz modulated frequency and today our patient is not sleeping and he is adult so we will use a 40 hertz modulating frequency so we are ready so uh, we have finished with ABR and now uh, the patient is the same so we can uh, choose the new test template using this Dropbox menu. So we go to the multi ISS test and now we need to choose the proper um, modulation frequency. So we see the adult awake, it's 40 Hertz. And now we are going to the test window. You see here uh, the panel uh, of the red color for the right ear and uh, the blue color for the left ear. And you see the main frequencies of stimulation and our modulation frequency is 40 Hertz. And now uh, they see here that uh, all of the stimulus frequency will start with the 50 dB intensity. Also, we need to check the impedance. 
you see that it's okay. Good. Also, we need to check if we use the proper uh, uh, stimulator type. Here we see the inserts now and the right model. Uh, we need to monitor the signal. We see here uh, the mostly time is green. It's good. And after that, uh, we ask our patient to stay still and relax during the acquisition to close uh, his eyes. And after that, uh, they can start the stimulation process. And they see that they simultaneously in all frequency, uh, they see the graphics, uh, which means uh, the uh, growth of probability of response uh, which we get in each frequency of stimulation. We see that the speed of growth or the probability is different uh, depending on the frequency. In most cases, uh, it, it is uh, more fast. Uh, we can get the response on the higher frequencies and uh, some more time we need to get the response in the lower frequency, especially on the 50, uh, 500 hertz. Uh, in our uh, situation today, it's due uh, the high level of uh, residual noise in this frequency band. So uh, they see that they get the response on the 4000 hertz from the right side and from the left side, and uh, that uh, uh, our device automatically goes uh, to the lower intensity on, in uh, the stimulus that they, they get the response already. And uh, in other uh, frequency, um, the process is going on the starting intensity. And uh, after uh, this panel, they see the panel of uh, trials uh, then they get the response. Uh, they see the green box here. If uh, we have no any response on this intensity, for example, on the 50 dB um, at, at the end of the time, we will get the red box. And uh, the device will automatically go up to the 60 dB and will go uh, till the time uh, it requires um, the response. Uh, if we go to the audiogram panel, they see that they have some points, then uh, we get the response. They see the gray uh, uh, points here. Uh, and uh, mm, nearly the red dots for the right ear and the blue um, that's for the left ear uh, accordingly uh, to the estimated audiogram. The coefficients they just um, put it on different frequencies. For example, they see here the difference is bigger than here on the 2000 gears is uh, brought from the literature and um, put it automatically by device. Uh, so, uh, we uh, should do nothing, only monitor the patient condition. And uh, maybe in some cases, uh, we need to see, uh, maybe uh, go to the manual um, registration. So then they see that the response is uh, not acquired on this frequency. Uh, and in this intensity, we can make it, for example, some much higher. And this attempt will stop. And the attempt on the next intensity will start. It can save our time if the doctors see that there is no any response in this intensity. And to save the time, we can not uh, go further in this intensity. So you can also manage the test in the manual manner if you want. Uh, so 
in some frequencies we see that the stimulation intensity is lower enough and in some frequencies we uh, uh, didn't get the response on the starting intensity. So we need some more time to monitor. As Michael said, if you use uh, the ISSR test, you will um, choose the frequency and the site of stimulation each time in the manual uh, manner. And uh, you need to switch on the new one every time after you start the previous one. And in the multi ssr test, uh, you didn't. You, uh, you won't do it. So all the tests go automatically. So we collect a lot of now. And after that, we see uh, uh, that uh, device will calculate the average treasured accordingly to these points. So it will be summarized to the average treasured. So we see that uh, if we don't have response in this frequency, the device will go up to the high intensity. Then uh, the doctor uh, think that thinks that uh, it's enough, for example. Uh, the doctor can stop here the acquisition and the test will stop. Uh, all the trials that, I, uh, that were in progress will be stopped and light on with the red boxes as uh, and uh, trials uh, without uh, getting the response. Uh, so we have uh, made two tests for this patient, ABR test and the multi ssr test. And after that, we can make the report. Uh, before you make the report, please uh, look at your uh, screen because uh, all the curves that you get, for example, in ABR will be in the same uh, way in your report as it uh, was in your ABR test here and down the screen. So uh, you can uh, go here after that. And for example, uh, we will generate black and white report or colorful, for example, if you want. It needs some time to, to be generated. And we see here uh, the name of the patient that uh, we um, printed, the date of acquisition, and uh, the name of the test, our montage scheme, our curves. Uh, how it uh, were put, uh, the numbers of latencies and amplitudes, uh, the graphs of norms of latencies and so on for the ABR. And after that, all the tests uh, also which uh, were made uh, for this patient. Uh, we uh, made multi-SSR, so we see the estimated audiogram now uh, the trials also, and the average treasured. Uh, today, uh, we um, did not finish multi ssr Of course, in the clinics, uh, it requires some more times, and uh, we um, will get some, some numbers for other frequencies too. But today, we save the time, and the principles is clear, I think. So, um, I 
didn't finish at all. And after that, the doctor can print the conclusion by uh, themselves and print uh, this report using uh, simple printer, Windows printer. Uh, that's all I think about report and about multi-ISSR. Uh, 